Um, thank you very much. We're trying to understand how open data and big data actually make a difference in the international development field. Uh, that's our whole reason for being. But maybe I will give you a few tidbits about really why we're interested in this. A little bit because of this. There's a huge amount of hyperbole in this space. McKinsey especially loves hyperbole. Three trillion dollars of value. Um, at the OGP, the Open Government Partnership Summit in Brasilia in 2012, the key press release said, open data saves lives. That was the heading. Um, some of you, of course, know Wired. Um, Chris Anderson, the, one of the editors or the ex-editors of Wired, has said that big data will lead to the end of theory. So it's going to revolutionize the scientific process. No more theory. Why? Because you've got so much data out there that you can just look for correlations. No need for theory building. Of course, he's been ripped apart for that, but I won't uh, get too much into that. But this is just to say there's been a huge amount of hyperbole around this, huge amount of claims about how this potentially makes a difference to the world and to the developing world as well. There's also been a huge amount of cynicism. Um, anybody involved in the technology for development space knows a guy called Evgeny Morozov. Evgeny Morozov has essentially made it his career to criticize everything about the technology for development field. He essentially sees it as um, uh, corporate capture, that it makes people like Google and Facebook look really good, um, but that in essence, most of what happens in this technology for development field is a crock. So he would say, anyways. Um, one of his more interesting uh, thoughts is that the reason why digital activism works on Facebook is simply statistical probability. There are so many cases of Facebook digital activist groups, like say somebody trying to improve the water quality in Bermuda, um, there are thousands if not tens of thousands of these kinds of digital activism movements on Facebook, so you're bound to have a few that make a difference. It's just statistical probability. So what's the reality? Well, most of the time we would consider right now that it's neither the hyperbole, neither the cynicism. Reality is somewhere in the middle, but we really don't know. We're still trying to figure this out. And uh, part of where we're coming from is actually a huge uh, amount of experience in the area of ICTs for development. So the whole uh, digital technologies for development space where we were able to find out some pretty interesting things about how digital technologies make a difference in the development process. Um, and we moved recently to another space, and that's uh, based on the idea that there's something new happening. And we've coined that for now open development, and we actually have, I'm going to plug a, a book right now. There's a, a new book right there, Open Development, that my colleague Matthew Smith over there edited. Uh, you can get it freely online. And it sets the stage for the kinds of issues and uh, uh, tensions that potentially you need to think about when thinking about this open revolution and issues around big data. By the way, I, I feel a little bit like Martin Helbert. I feel like I should go back a step and, and ask you, does everybody understand the difference between big data and open data and crowdsource data? Is there anybody in the room that doesn't understand that? You sure? You, you've all, you're all okay with that? Okay, good. Because last time I did this talk, there was a vast amount of misunderstanding around these issues. And they are very different, especially for an international development perspective. You're talking about very different issues, very different tensions. So what are we funding? These are some of the initiatives. Um, there's exploring the emerging impacts of open data in developing countries, the open data barometer, uh, open Data for Development Network in Latin America, and the Caribbean Open Institute uh, 
and Learn Asia. Those are just some of the projects that we're funding right now that are looking at this whole issue of big and open data. Um, interestingly, some of the issues that have been talked about during this talk are actually direct questions that we are asking in some of these projects. Um, especially the exploring the emerging impacts of open data in developing countries, which we in shorthand call ODDC, um, is really trying to understand the benefits of open data on such elements as entrepreneurship, uh, economic gain. It's also trying to understand the extent to which it leads to transparency and accountability. And it's trying to understand the extent to which the benefits are inclusive or not. Do, uh, do the poor actually ever use this kind of data? Do they get benefits from it? Here's a little bit of a, a deep dive into what we're doing. So Learn Asia, which is a, a think tank in Sri Lanka, and uh, Halani Galpaya is here. Raise your hand. Halani uh, heads Learn Asia, and what they've been able to do is pretty incredible. They've been able to get their hands on uh, mobile data sets in Sri Lanka. It is one of only two organizations to have been able to to, to do this in the developing country, uh, in the developing world, sorry. This is a very rare feat. Mobile operators do not want to share their data. And essentially, with this data, they tried to see what kind of development issues could be solved, what kind of development issues could be uh, investigated and, and better understood. One of the interesting things they did was to actually look at um, the extent to which uh, mobile SIM numbers could predict population density and migration. So what this map tells you is that in the red part, you've got um, essentially a greater amount of density or a greater amount of people during the day, and the blue parts show less amount of people during the day. So typically what, you would, uh, what this would reveal is that you've got labor migration from uh, the rural area or the peri-urban area to the urban area. Does that seem fairly normal? It's what you would expect. So absolutely, it's totally normal. The interesting thing is that this actually costs about a fraction of what the household survey cost. So this gets back to the predictive value or proxy value of this data it potentially helps government save money, right? There are a few issues we need to work out, but it actually is a pretty good demonstration right now that there is economic value for governments in using these kinds of methods. Second, harass map. And this is a tough one to talk about because we just talked about it in, um, in the session before. And harass map is probably, you know, one of the, the, the most talked about uh, crowdsourced applications. So it deals with uh, sexual harassment and sexual violence in, uh, in Egypt. And this is a map of incidents. And what it's done is essentially show that um, you, can, you can actually find out certain things that you wouldn't normally be able to find out if you weren't using crowdsourced data. For example, 72% of the women uh, who were sexually harassed were actually veiled. Now that's a really interesting issue because what that did was actually uh, dispel the myth that these were women who were kind of dressed in a Western way or something like that. So that dispelled that myth. Second, 9% of the people who committed sexual harassment were prepubescent boys. Now that's a pretty interesting fact because again, the assumption was that this was all about uh, sexual frustration. But no, we found out through this data that there's something else going on. So that's, that's a pretty interesting issue in terms of what uh, crowdsource data can tell you from a research point of view. But going back to our discussion after lunch about whether data is representative or not when it's crowdsourced. 
Well, one interesting finding was that actually there are times at which crowdsourced data can be more useful from a research perspective than a traditional household survey. So sexual harassment is actually a good example of that. Sexual harassment is something that uh, women would have a hard time talking about if they were directly interviewed, right? So the fact that you have anonymous means of communicating or reporting these things actually leads you to potentially have more valid data. So it's a really interesting take on this. So all that to say that this whole issue of whether crowdsourced data or other proxies for data are less representative than traditional um, data collection techniques is still an open question. We really don't know that. Let's talk a little bit about the tensions in data-driven development. So the first one is the ideological dimension. So Arkin Fung, who is uh, at the Kennedy School of um, the Kennedy School at Harvard, has uh, studied who uses data.gov data, which is the big kind of open government platform in the US. Interestingly, he found out that it's mostly right-wing think tanks and media companies or reporters who want to criticize the government. So it would seem that there's uh, um, a sense that open government, or especially open government data, is mostly used to de delegitimize the state. At least that's his theory. Now that's interesting from a Western point of view, but when you take into account the fact that the developing world includes a lot of authoritarian regimes, all of a sudden open government takes on an even greater perspective. It makes it that much more relevant. Second, you've heard this before, but power is a huge issue when dealing with open data and big data. Well, I would say open data more. So um, who in the room knows about the Bangalore example of digitizing land records? Wow, I'm surprised. This is the most, oh, one person. Uh, and I know two people because Matt as well. So Bangalore is the most cited example of how open data doesn't work sometimes. They digitized their land records, and what happened? And they made it openly available. What happened? A land grab by the elites, right? They kicked out the slum dwellers who were squatting on land that hadn't yet been, uh, you know, the, 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 didn't have property rights yet. Worse, a study after that showed that there's actually more corruption with the digitization process having been done than there was before. So obviously something went wrong. So whenever you're trying to think about using open data or digital uh, projects in general, always take into account the issue of power. People have been saying that for a long time, but the, the people who are into aspiration, as Tim said, tend to forget some of the basics when it comes to that. Three is uh, something around local capacities. Essentially, we've got a problem with who is actually using this kind of data. So the only other big data um, activity other than Sri Lanka was in Ivory Coast, where the mobile operator, Orange, agreed to release its data on users. And essentially what happened then is that uh, a few other organizations had a data for development challenge. And uh, they put out a call. And they got some very interesting proposals. This is one of them. This was uh, by IBM Research, where they're able to map out bus routes in uh, Abidjan. Very interesting. <laughs> Gave more uh, data on exactly how people were traveling and where bus routes were and things like that. The problem was when they actually had that competition, not a single African institution was involved, right? Not a single institution in Ivory Coast was involved. This is a problem. This ends up being research that's extremely extractive. This ends up being research that doesn't build local capacity, really. So this is a huge danger and one that uh, funders and actors in this space need to be aware of. 
Now, privacy. We've talked about it. I wasn't at the session, but um, it is, of course, a huge issue. But interestingly, um, that same Data for Development Challenge project actually explained, to a certain extent, why it's such an important issue. Because one of the papers that came out actually said that if you had four points of data spatial, of spatial location, you could uh, uniquely verify any one person. So essentially, what they were saying is that it's almost impossible to completely anonymize mobile user data. Some people are still trying to figure that out, uh, notably LearnAsia, who, uh, amongst their other tasks, are trying to come up with privacy guidelines for mob mobile operators so that they know when they can release this data and when they can't. But this paper, anyways, clearly showed that there needs to be even stronger protections for user data, user mobile data, or else individuals can be identified. Interestingly, I've, I've sometimes heard people say that privacy is a, is a Western luxury. It is, it is actually not that relevant for the developing world. And hence, why should we worry that much about privacy in, you know, in the open data world? Well, the, the big reason is that um, for a lot of people, the Rwandan genocide was actually facilitated by a huge privacy breach. And the reason for that is this ID right here. The ID, I don't know if you can see it, but actually uh, gives the ethnic identification. It says that this person is a Tutsi. So as you can imagine, what happened was that this greatly facilitated the massacres during the Rwandan genocide. And this is something to think about when putting in place huge databases of individuals trying to intervene through biometric ID systems or electoral ID systems, as many, many countries are. India's doing it, Argentina's doing it. More and more countries are putting in place these types of ID systems that will turn into big data and that have potentially huge ramifications. And this is the main reason why uh, one of our key partners in India, um, Sunil Abraham, has said this. And this is, I think, one of the more important things to take into account when thinking about issues of open data, transparency, and the extent to which privacy is important. And on that note, that's it. Um, I wanted to end with a, a thank you to Nick for inviting me and for also putting together a really, really good show. I was really impressed with the, the level of uh, the panels and uh, the keynotes. Um, I think this is a great event that just whet the appetite of, of many people about this issue. So a round of applause for Nick.